Hi, good evening. We're excited to have a standing room only crowd tonight. Thank you all for being here in spite of the fact that uh, we're suddenly in winter despite not having fall. Um, and welcome all of you to the second installment of the Nasher's Art and Health series. I am Curator of Education Anna Smith and this evening we will focus on conditions affecting the body. Stephen Hawking once joked that rather than being a disadvantage, his disabilities were an asset because they shielded him from the lecturing and administrative work loaded onto his peers. <laughs> Take that as you will. Tonight, we'll learn about artists who, when faced with physical challenges or limitations, refuse to quit, instead finding new ideas and methods to continue their work. In a moment, I'll turn things over to Bonnie Pittman, who's been a driving force behind this series, lending her wit and expertise to the formulation of each program. I would also like to express our appreciation for Donna Wilhelm, without whose generous support the series would not be possible. Tonight's panelists are Dr. Kathleen Bell, Chair of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at UT Southwestern Medical Center and an O'Donnell Brain Institute member, Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman, Founder and Chief Director of the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas, Jed Morse, Chief Curator for the Nasher Sculpture Center, Bonnie Pittman, Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History and Director of Art Brain Innovations for the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas, and John Pamara, Artist and professor of, visual, excuse me, a professor of Visual Art at the University of Texas at Dallas. Please join me in giving them all a warm welcome as we begin tonight's discussion. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. And um, I was worried about a third of you weren't going to come, so I'm even more excited. I am so honored to be with all of you and with our speakers tonight for the second in this series. My great um, thanks to uh, the Nasher Sculpture Center, and in particular, Jeremy Strick, uh, the director who listened to me chatter on for months about why I wanted to do this series, and to Anna Smith, who's helped in so many different ways to make it come to fruition and hopefully um, add something to the life of our community and to our um, our own experiences. Um, I, to, I, many of you know, I used to be the director of the Dallas Museum of Art, and in 2012, I had to resign because I became extremely sick with an undiagnosed, still today, 11 years later, uh, respiratory ailment. And as a result of that, I took a deep dive into art and medicine. It was the, I took the two things that I was now exposed to. One was, um, well, uh, one was m my lifetime experience in art museums, and so I knew the museum was a place that I could go and look at art and heal, and I needed to do that. And then the second part is this new exposure to all these medical things that they were doing to me, and endless hours in hospitals and, and, uh, and in uh, different treatments, let me just say that, that they were the doctors were exper experimenting when I call them pinch me, punch me, and poke me with great respect. Um, but Dr. Rosenblatt at Baylor was at UT Southwestern and now at Baylor has done a remarkable job. And I'm here tonight in large measure to the great work that he's done to keep me going. I am compelled to say that the power of art in healing is become so real to me because it's healed me time and time and time again. And it's also a great story in the history of art. So tonight, I'm going to give you a quick overview of um, art, some of the history of art and medicine and then illustrate some artists that are not going to be covered in the Nasher collection. Jed Morse is going to, has taken two artists, Suvaro and Matisse, from the Nasher collection, and you'll hear his uh, comments about that. And then Dr. Bell is going to talk about her experience as a physician in rehabilitation and also artists that she's worked with. And then Dr. Chapman's going to talk about the healing environment and the power of art in, in those circumstances, particularly with the Center for Brain Health. I, um, it's a, and then John Pamara, our wonderful artist, he comes before Sandy, sorry about that. But John is a, a friend and colleague out at UT Dallas, and his work is in the University of Texas, UT Southwestern Medical Center, especially in a number of different buildings. And uh, 
he'll relate his story about being a cancer patient and how in many different ways it has impacted his life and his art production. So it's a big program, I know that, and uh, so I hope you're comfortable in your seat. We will, <laughs> and if you need a drink or something, just get up and get it. If uh, we're hoping to be out of here by 8.30, what I'm going to do is if you have a burning question after I talk or somebody else talks, you can dash your hand up and we'll answer burning questions because we, what we want to do is get to the end and have a discussion with you. And so I'll only ask one question of the panel because what we really want to do is turn it over for you to ask a lot of questions. So again, burning questions, hands up, no, no problem. Okay, here we go. I know I'm going to push the wrong button, but you know, off we go. And so um, one of the things that <clears throat> that's important, I think, is the imp this just highlights the important role that arts play today in medical um, <clears throat> medical centers and so many, Dr. Flishman who was here last, year, last week from Baylor talked about the specific programs at Baylor where he has seen artists and art making come into the patients and how it's lowered heart rates and improved their ability to get up and walk and, and just reduced anxiety. Um, it's more than that, it really is a powerful way to heal and I can't stress that enough because the um, in times of being ill, you are often alone. And that loneliness can take over you because nobody really understands what you're going through. That isolation, that pain, that experience is yours and yours alone. And as loving and kind as your doctors, family, or friends are, none of them experience what you're going through. But artists, are amazing in the ways that they have taken those moments and illustrated them and conquered, uh, the brought out the resilience in them and created new forms of art. And that's the story of tonight. It's about creativity and resilience. It all starts with our blood. You know, we started, um, this is where we um, first, artworks that you see in the Paleolithic caves, Neolithic caves are animals getting killed and people getting killed. So there's already blood spilling everywhere. So we know that that was an important element in art all throughout history of art. I was thinking I'd make show you only gruesome pictures tonight, but I spared you. Um, and then disease, you know, the great diseases that um, swept over um, all cultures from, that are documented, Athens was wiped out one third of the population um, from a, um, some sort of a bacterial infection. We know about the plague. It, it's constantly there and hidden, but it does affect us. This is um, the first documented surgeries, and Dr. Bell, you can help me. I practiced all afternoon treth Trepanation is uh, trepanation, and that's when they bore holes in your head to either relieve the pressure um, <clears throat> on your head. It could have also been from an injury, but it's documented all the way back into uh, ancient history, and it was the first documented surgery that we know about. The, um, of course, with the Egyptians' eyes, and there's a huge history of Egyptian medicine, but eye surgery was very important, as you've read um, many times there, it wore these elaborate eye ornament, uh, eye, uh, eye ointments, uh, largely to protect their eyes from the flies and other species that would go in and infect them. And here's a cataract um, surgeon uh, operating, and those are the kinds of tools that they used in ancient Egypt. Um, as we moved into Greece, of course, the great Hippocrates is the founder of medicine, and Greek physicians were highly skilled at treating um, their patients, especially they were, um, had to do this often on the, in war. And so we, um, on the Greek vases that look so silent in the museum, you can find these different images. Moving up into um, more recent history, this is a wonderful <clears throat> image of Dr. Agnew, and it's actually he's retiring at age 70, and this is his. Uh, this is his. Um, he's doing a surgery on a on a breast of, of a young woman, and uh, around him are all of his uh, young students and the physicians that he worked with. So it's kind of an interesting way to have your portrait uh, commemorated, you know, right down to the last moment of your life um, in the surgical, um, in the surgery round. But it's uh, the realism, and this is, of course, by Aikens, is uh, profound here. And he studied uh, many, there were many sketches of the surgery before he actually did the final painting. 
Civil War um, was, a, um, like many wars, was a very important phase in art, but also <clears throat> in medical history, because wars were when you have to learn new medical procedures to save, um, to save the patients. And unfortunately, in the Civil War, there was a lot of gangrene and, and the use of the lack of real help at the, at the uh, sites of the different um, battles. And so you see these very gruesome pictures of um, the men going through amputations. They often did that first because it was easier and you know you'd save the patient, you may not save the limb. And so those are the kinds of decisions that doctors make. And then on the other side, of course, um, as many of you know, the Red Cross was founded in um, the Civil War and it was the, when women came in to care for the patients and especially in, in the Northern Territories. Um, World War II, again, artists were sent out, often commissioned during the wars, to go out to photograph and document it. And this was a very important, um, Samuel Wolfe was a very important uh, part. He was an army sergeant, and he was sent into war to document what was going on, both in the battles and in the medical rooms. Um, this is a story that I think very few people know about, and I brought it in because of... Um, uh, of the uh, National Sculpture Center, there's a very well-known woman in England who was a sculptor, and she was the first one to make face masks for the men after World War II. And unfortunately, you can see these are Otto Hicks's drawings on the right, but a lot of people came home from the war with enormous disfiguration on their face, and other people couldn't look at them. And they didn't have plastic surgery at the level that we do now. And so she made over... 500 masks, and you can see them there. They were better colored, but they've been uh, highlighted in yellow, so you could see these face masks could be worn by people so that they could live and operate in everyday life. And then, unfortunately, uh, two years, uh, three years after the war, World War I, she ran out of money to keep doing this work, and you just wonder of all the, all the people that she helped. There are many people who um, have had disabilities, and of course, probably the best known of, in America is um, uh, Roosevelt, and who m Americans elected and didn't know he was in a wheelchair. And so it's an important story that people who are disabled, who have chronic illnesses, one in every two people in this room either has a chronic illness or is treating somebody who is a friend who has one. So it's an enormous part of our population. But it's what the individual who is uh, with these challenges, what they have to do is make decisions about how they want to be seen in the world and how they want to be treated. And um, I think it's so powerful that we didn't know until very late in his presidency that uh, how physically challenged he was. That is not his, uh, that's uh, amputation, um, what is it called? It's not amputation. Prosthetic was, uh, those were again uh, developed most, uh, most of the time after World War I. So back to beautiful things. Um, George O'Keefe is one of the artists we're talking about later in the series, but um, it is, uh, the arts are an important way, even if they're used as part of the documentation of art history, um, to tell us about uh, what it means to be human, the suffering, the compassion, the different stages of illness. And um, it's a unique attribute. We're going to be talking about artists today who have had AIDS and uh, arthritis, cancer, and let's see, spinal injuries and syphilis. And um, first up, have to say, is Manet, the great um, early Impressionist artist. He's, uh, and Manet had syphilis, and um, he also had rheumatoid, rheumatism. And he um, ended up just two year, uh, a few weeks before his death, having to have his uh, foot amputated by gangrene. But pretty much the last part of his life, he suffered um, with these diseases, and it became more and more difficult for him to paint. And so we, we all know those early, large-scale uh, paintings by, uh, that Mane did. And over at the museum is this great one in the Reeves collection, and you can see his control of brush strokes and all of the beautiful um, elegance of the color and design. But as he got later into his works, um, his control over his hands began to fail. And he had to paint smaller and smaller paintings that were on easels so that he could be, because he couldn't stand anymore. And he also, um, 
was confined to often he used to like to go out and do uh, image record images but in this case this is one of the last paintings that he did um, <clears throat> which is very well known and it's pretty large scale but it took him a very long time to do it largely because his hand was shaking so much he stopped doing watercolors completely as a result of his disease Auguste Renoir um, probably known to all of us um, this is an artist that did six thousand paintings during his lifetime and um, an extraordinary and of course is being a big show is opening over at the Renoir over at the uh, museum and not uh, Fort Worth at the Kimball not to be missed and uh, he um, had a rheumatoid arthritis and you're going to see you can see him painting right now and those are his hands that were bound and crippled and um, in, in oops we don't have time for that tonight so Moving right along, these are the normal, beautiful Renoir paintings that we see of his work, um, both at the DMA and a great sculpture that we have over there from Margaret. Um, and this is, this is when you can see him now, later in his career, he was confined to a wheelchair, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, and he did this painting, and you can see his paintbrush is strapped to his hand while he's painting. And now you can see a difference between 1887 and 1918, when the year he died, of two figures of nudes, how, nudes, how his style changed. And, and, and the um, beautiful, beautiful, always loved beautiful, glowing, fleshy women. There's no question about that. He had a great love of that. But his style did change because of his disease. Uh, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec had a lot of things going on with him throughout his lifetime. Um, <clears throat> But his, uh, he died of syphilis and other complications. Of course, he lived mostly in the bordellos in uh, Paris. But he um, had a great love of being in the moment and painting what he saw. And so that is important. Keith Haring, um, one of the great 20th century artists who documented AIDS uh, relentlessly and ruthlessly. He just wasn't afraid to say what was going on. And he had a, um, his own balloon in the, and I forget what year it was in the Macy's Day Parade, but it's great iconic images of um, people suffering with AIDS and brought this into international attention. Another artist who I love is Felix Gonzalez Torres. He's owned by a number of collectors here in Dallas. And he really um, touched on, through his stories of AIDS, the tr trauma of, uh, and, the, and the beauty of life coming together and disappearing. So this is a piece that uh, is uh, about 500, um, it's about 200 pounds of green candy and you each pick up one. And so it disappears while it's on view, right before you're very, we never re-nourish it, it just goes away. And just like life, life passes. And then I think this is one of the great iconic images of his work. These uh, two clocks are set, and it was done in honor of his life partner. Um, they sit side by side, touching, and it's just like life. You know, they they're on a battery, and they'll begin to run down, and um, you see the seconds just beginning to get off, and it's that touching moment where life becomes a beginning and an end, and it's all it's about. Frida Kahlo, I am in deep trouble because I'm going too long, um, is, uh, has a long list there. I talked a little bit about her last week. Um, her work really represents the great, um, I think more than any other artist, suffering. She was able to depict the actual experience of suffering. And because she had 36 operations, 32 operations, um, amputations, she was in an accident when she was just a young teenager that crushed her back and her pelvis and everything. Um, <clears throat> And in 1953, shortly before her death, she had her leg amputated. So it was a, just a life filled with pain. And you can see the excruciating um, uh, way in which she depicts her body. But the Tree of Hope, which is the woman on the, on the um, what is that called, the gurney, and Frida is sitting up holding the back brace, that is when she was going through one of her many back surgeries that she had to experience over and over again. She did, um, in the United States, have uh, a miscarriage, and this is this very tragic um, moment in her life when she finally got pregnant and lost the child, but the story of what it did to her psychologically is riveting. And here, um, here she is in bed, and above her, the green growing over here demonstrates growth and rebirth and all of that. And the, the uh, <clears throat> skeleton on the top, who was kind of um, 
bombs and everything is obviously death. So we don't have to worry about what we're looking at here. But she is, that is her bed. You can see it in her actual home and the painting in her home. And you can see that if you look above the, um, her pillow, there's a square right there. And that's the mirror that she painted her many, many self-portraits from because she was in bed so much of the time. A friend of many of us in the room was a wonderful Dallas artist, Scott Barber, who painted these remarkable pictures of his melanoma, his um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And they are so beautiful. He did a whole series of them that um, I sometimes go to doctor's offices here in Dallas and see them. Another friend, Nick Nicosia, had a heart attack and then suffered uh, cancer. And Nick is, uh, and I connected recently about our physical challenges and illnesses. We all know his great photography um, that is, and sculptures that are well regarded all over in museums around the country. Um, this is the new work that he's doing, which is about the <clears throat> 24,000 uh, breaths and, uh, excuse me, the 86,000, 80, yeah, 86,400 seconds in a day. So every single circle up there has a quarter of that. Don't ask me to say that number. But it is, um, they are extraordinary, and they really mark the time. He's done a whole series, some of just the hours. Here's one of the series of 12. So if you met, and Nick, and Nick and I got into our meditation, how important it is. He has a show up right now at his gallerist, um, Aaron uh, Cluley, um, and it's beautiful. So go down and see it, no plug for them. And this is our last artist, Yinka Shanabari, um, who is an African um, artist uh, from London who had a transverse Mylitis, mylitis, which is a way that par um, when he was young and it paralyzed half of his body and he makes these incredibly, that's a large scale sculpture. I wanted to, you to see it in front, in, uh, down at the, um, in London. And uh, he does enormous, wonderful sculptures. He does videos using African <clears throat> based uh, um, clothing and designs. Uh, in his pieces, and this is one of his other sculptures. But his work is very much about um, not, uh, you know, he said, I'm paralyzed, you know, but I figured out how to create um, and do things joyfully. So as we, um, as we close, it's just a reminder again about the power of art and healing. Um, and very importantly, um, this, I love this quote from Renoir, the pain passes. Uh, but beauty remains. And so the power of artists to recreate um, in new circumstances is what this is all about. So thank you very much. And um, I'm going to turn it over. If there aren't any burning questions, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jed. Great. OK. Oh. Yeah, those are my precious notes. Oh, yes, here. Everything with numbers is written down. <laughs> um. So I will be brief. I'm talking just about Henri Matisse and uh, Marc de Souvereau, uh, both of them artists in the Nasher collection and the collection of the Dallas Museum of Art, many collections around the United States and around the world. Um, and both of them have uh, suffered a variety of uh, physical uh, ailments over, you know, during their lifetimes. Um, so uh, Bonnie very graciously gave me her slides on Matisse. And so I'm using hers. And she, she notes that, that uh, Matisse suffered from uh, intestinal cancer and necrosis. There's a little bit of debate about that. So what happened is, uh, so there's the famous story of Matisse um, suffering from what he, what he called uh, throughout his entire life an appendicitis. When he was young, he had just finished his training as a young attorney, was working as a law clerk, absolutely hated it, had an appendicitis, was recovering at home, and his mother bought him a box of paints to kind of pass the time while he was recovering, and that set him on his artistic career from that point on. Um, there, there is some supposition that uh, that you know there were this was not an appendicitis but actually a hernia and that it it, it, it kept giving him problems throughout the rest of his life, in um, 
in 19, uh, uh, including in 1937, and then it erupted fiercely again in May of 1940, um, but went undiagnosed and untreated for seven months, uh, and it was further complicated by a possible tumor and risk of heart failure. He had two surgeries, uh, one on January 16th, the other on January 20th in 1941, had a pulmonary embolism on January 23rd, and again on March 2nd or 3rd. Um, his surgical wound became infected, and he recovered from that, but uh, was essentially bedridden with limited mobility for the rest of his life. Now, um, we of course know Matisse from um, the many beautiful paintings and sculptures, drawings, uh, lithographs that he made throughout his life, the incredible lyrical figures, um, the beautiful colors um, that, that uh, characterize these, these fantastic works of art. Um, and, but it really wasn't until um, he suffered this, um, you know, this in incredible pain as a result of this uh, surgery and infection uh, very late in life that really um, forced him to come up with the greatest innovation of his career, which are the cutouts. So imagine Matisse being um, you know, this, this artist who, from the time that he discovered art, was compelled to create and, and essentially put aside most of, the, of, of, of his life in order to follow um, you know, his, uh, his, his need to make works of art suddenly unable to stand, um, unable to get out of bed. There's a wonderful story of his uh, model and secretary um, capturing a mosquito in, uh, underneath a glass next to his bed so that he could draw it. Um, but you know, there's that, that, con that need to create did not go away even though he was severely limited. Um, and it was really due to those limitations and that need to still create that, um, you know, that, that caused him to find a new way to do it. And the, the, the important thing about, um, about the innovation of the uh, cutouts is that it, it actually combined the two major pursuits of his career, painting and sculpture in, in, into, in a single medium. He talked about the cutouts, of, which are really just simply using cut colored paper and collaging it to make these beautiful compositions um, as, as like carving directly into color. Um, so you know, you, if you imagine these, these incredibly beautiful, colorful paintings that he's been making throughout his career, um, and uh, the kinds of sculptures that he made, which he modeled always by hand. He was not a carver. He was, he was really a modeler. Um, but then finding that he could create painting in a way in, in terms of carving and, and composing color um, in this kind of collage format as you know, re really rejuvenating him and giving him uh, a second life. Um, Mark de Suvero, who has works of art um, uh, throughout the city of Dallas, but most prominently in front of the Dallas Museum of Art, which if you haven't seen it recently, go by and see it because the conservators have just repainted it and it looks gorgeous. And um, just behind us here in the Nasher Sculpture Center garden. Um, we know Mark for these enormous um, constructions uh, made out of steel and I-beams sometimes painted uh, glorious colors, um, sometimes um, completely raw. But um, it, it may surprise you to learn that Mark, um, at, when he was 27, suffered a terrible construction accident. He was pinned between uh, the top of a construction elevator and the bottom of a door jam uh, for an hour. And he, 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 um, he in an interview, he talked about this experience. He said, I went through one hour of one ton pressure. I was conscious the whole time. That hour was longer than my whole life. It was just infinity. So from this experience, he spent basically the next year hospitalized. Um, the doctors told him he wouldn't be able to walk again for the rest of his life. Um, but, you know, 
as you can tell from the photos here, Mark is an incredibly determined person, and um, he did not let that stop him. And within a few years, he was walking again with the aid of braces. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, around this time, uh, you know, in 1959, he was making things that he could make with his own two hands. Um, some of those were smaller scale sculptures. Um, some of the most emphatic ones were of his own hand that had been uh, being uh, pierced by um, a steel bar. Um, and some larger scale, like, oh, here we go. We've got, I've got the hand too. Um, at larger scale, like, um, like the one on the left here, um, which are, you know, take these, these kind of, these big uh, construction timbers. He lived, uh, you know, he was from San Francisco. He loved shipbuilding. Um, he lived down by, uh, you know, in, in the southern part of Manhattan by the shipyards and was using materials that he could, that he could easily find. So a lot of these things were from scuttled ships. Um, and building them by hand. Uh, and so, you know, when he lost his range of mobility and was limited to uh, a wheelchair for several years, he started making things that were larger than himself and that required the help of other people, but they were, that were about movement, that were about mobility. He made, um, he made toys and rides, sculptures that were rides, essentially, for the kids in his neighborhood. That, would, that they could get on and spin around in and move. And movement became an essential part of, of, of his sculpture. He started making works that had kinetic elements as part of them. Um, when we installed the sculpture at, here at the Nasher, uh, Mark was here on site. If you, if, 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 um, you know, if the, uh, he's, He's very proud of the fact that he's maintained his crane operator's license his entire life. And if the crane company that we were using here at the Sculpture Center had let him, he would have gotten in that cab and put the thing together himself. As it was, it was just about all his assistants could do to keep him from, from climbing up the sculpture and bolting it together. They couldn't keep him from um, welding the foot on his own. So you can see, I don't know if you, it's, it's pretty small on these screens, but you know, down by his foot are, is, are his braces that he's cast aside uh, so that he can get down on his knees and, and weld the sculpture. So he is still incredibly active to this day. He recently lost part of a leg to um, a, um, a, uh, um, a circulatory problem. And, um, but you know, the, he, that of course, still has not stopped him from, from making uh, these incredibly large and heavy works of art. So I think that is the end of my Let me see, do I have another slide? Nope, Kathleen Bell, Kathleen is up. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have a burning question? Otherwise, <laughs> we can answer it at, you know, uh, when we're all up here on stage. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I can do this. There are two buttons. <laughs> I think I can do this one. Um, I'm very delighted to be here today. Um, I was telling Jed that this truly is my favorite museum in Dallas. I've only lived here for five years, and one of the things we've spent a lot of time doing is scouring around museums because we love to do that, and this is, this is, uh, this is kind of a home for us, so we really love it. So I'm going to kind of take this a little bit different. I'm going to talk about two people that I'm pretty, I, pretty knowledgeable about. One who was a, an acquaintance that I had in Seattle through my uh, involvement with the brain injury world. Uh, that's something that I've specialized in my whole career. And, and really got to know her um, and, and really was so inspired by her. And another one is one of my old patients. Um, I took care of him for more than 25 years, and I thought I would bring you through his journey a little bit as well. Anything I'm going to show you tonight has been shown in public. I'm not violating anybody's medical records or, or rights or anything like that. So um, let me reassure you of that. So I'm going to, and, and one thing I want to talk about, I think, with these two people, and I want you to think about as I'm talking, is 
the transition from being a singular artist to doing art through a community or having a community. And I think that's really kind of well, you kind of illustrated a little bit with, with the last artist you talked about, but I'll talk about it a little bit more and expand on it here. So making a new normal. And uh, so Ginny Ruffner is uh, a woman who lives in Seattle. And um, that in the top right, that is Ginny's studio which is literally like a fairyland. It's, it's an amazing place to visit. Um, but Ginny started um, working with glass art back in the 80s when Seattle was just, and still is a hotbed of, of glass and blown art. And, and Ginny made extremely intricate, beautiful, just incredibly ethereal um, pieces of art. Um, she was a highly successful artist, um, not only with just her art, but actually commercially. She actually ended up getting a lot of you know, commercial um, uh, uh, contracts and that sort of thing. So, and, but what happened to Ginny is that in, uh, in 1991 or 92, can't remember which, um, she was in a very horrible car accident back in the Charlotte area where she's, she's from the South and um, was then in a, really a coma or minimally responsive state for about two months and in a hospital for many, many months afterwards. And um, I'll just show you a little bit of Ginny here, I think. People see me walking with a cane or hear the way I talk and they assume that I'm slow, a little bit touched, as they say in the South. I'm probably smarter than, well, the camera for sure. My brain is fine. I talk funny. I walk slow, but so what? I'm still here and still creating. That's enough fun to be kidding for now. I'll be back on your way. <laughs> She's kind of a character. Um, but I, I don't know if you've noticed in that picture that Ginny was not moving her, her left arm. So she really has no functional use of her left arm at all. So this is a glass artist that made really intricate glass art who has now one, one arm. And that arm, mm, you know, is not as reliable as it used to be, as you can see from Ginny walking. So the, the interesting thing is that, and I think much as, as the artist you were talking about, the force to create really had, you know, was there and it was, go it was going to be answered no matter what happened. And, you know, Ginny spent years, years um, getting back on her feet and getting back to independent living again. So, you know, art to a certain point was set aside and then she found herself, now what do you do now? And I just found it so interesting that she did, in much in the way that Mark Sparrow did, she went, I'm gonna go big or go home. And so she did, she went big, right? So she started making very large um, metallic sculptures that are mechanical sculptures as well. This is, the reason I chose this particular one is because it's, it's outside on the corner, outside the Seattle Art Museum, and I used to pass it every day when I would pick my kids up from school. So I would see this sculpture every single day, and it's, it is a mechanical sculpture, and water comes out, and the flowers move, and you can look in that little hole there and see what's going on inside the mechanics of it. So, you know, she kind of went to this t art where the force of the art, the, the, the brilliance of it, the thoughts of it, the creation of it was coming from her, had to be carried out by a lot of other people. So there were teams of people involved, mechanical engineers and, and, and uh, m uh, metal artists, et cetera, who carried out her vision of how to do this sort of thing. Now, I was fascinated because I wanted to see what Ginny was doing these days, and I've been down here for five years and haven't really followed up. And so I went online, I thought, what is she doing these days? And wow, she is now into augmented reality. Okay, so talk about getting kind of a community in order to produce art. She is now working with computer scientists and uh, you know, informatics people who are putting together 
altered reality algorithms for art. So you can see that she's holding, holding a screen over something that's there and it augments that reality. So it brings a whole new vision of what reality is as you're looking through kind of a, a computer algorithm screen. So it's just, I, I just, it's just amazing to me. So she's moved on to a whole new community of people, computer scientists from her, uh, her metal engineers. So that's just, I think, one example of kind of how community propels artists. And um, this, is, this is another person. This is my friend, Brett. And um, I started treating Brett. Brett had a very severe brain injury. And when I first met Brett, Brett didn't move anything. That's Brett in the bed. Brett didn't move anything. He, he could track sometimes with his eyes but he wasn't speaking, couldn't move his anything. And, and, and it took, again, many years for Brett to be able to start moving again. And Brett and I spent many happy hours together while I was sticking large needles into his arms and legs and, so that he could move his arms and legs again. Um, so we became you know, pretty close. So um, Brett, and I'm going to bring you to the part, Brett's not doing art right now. Brett is learning how to move, right? Brett is learning how to stand. Brett is learning what to do with his arms and legs. And, and there are helpers. And Brett has his little nephew, who is his kind of inspiration, OK? So his family um, are part of kind of bringing him and dragging him through this and, and pushing him and you know when he got down, et cetera. This is a standing table. So this is the first way Brett could stand, is with the use of a hydraulic table. So we could put a strap around his rear end and put his knees against that thing and hydraulically lift him up into a standing position so he was able to practice standing again. I didn't mention, and I should have, that, that Brett was an art student. He was in graduate school for art at the time that he had his brain injury. OK, so he was an artist to begin with. Missed that one. Um, now you're seeing Brett start to get back into art again. So you can see at the table here, he's starting to work on some pieces here with a therapist who was working with him on art. So these are the first things that I got from Brett. These are holiday cards. OK, now he was injured in the 1990s. And this was probably in uh, at least well over 10, almost 15 years after his injury. And Brett was starting to produce art again. And I, I love the colors. I love the movement in these. But this was, the, this was where Brett was um, at this point in time. This was last year. So Brett, Brett had this um, at an art show last year. And this is a self-portrait. And so um, this is kind of where he's come over all that period of time. Um, and it was, it was just fascinating working with him uh, during this whole period of time because I, I got to actually see a lot more than I'm showing you here over time. And we could see, we could see the month when dimensionality returned and the month when this returned and that returned. But, but the really interesting thing is that everybody worked with Brett's art because we worked on getting him standing. And, and getting his arms moving again and, and keeping his spirits up. And there was just an army of people that were involved in, in producing that wonderful piece of art um, um, that Brett was able to do. And, and so I just think it's, it's just fascinating watching these two people whose brains were so damaged, so damaged, um, be able to uh, work towards, you know, what just wonderful expressions of movement and color and art and form um, uh, over such a long period of time. The human spirit is quite amazing, but the human community is quite amazing too. And I think that that really is a large part of what happens as well. Thank you. We'll save the burning questions. Thank you all for being here tonight. I want a special thanks to Bonnie for inviting me to, to be part of this panel, that, which I think is amazing. I've learned so much from everybody that's part of it. Uh, I, this is not going to be a talk about my work in general, but more specifically about the work I did for the UT Systems Cancer Clinic. 
Uh, but before I get started, I'd like to read you from my notes. Uh, this is what I brought tonight. Uh, this is sort of the official line about the large body of my work from the last 25 years. My current work investigates the conventions of painting and its relationship to the digital world and photography. I embrace both with a constant tension between their appearance on the surface. Uh, so that's the big picture. But tonight I want to give you the other picture of my work uh, that started about, actually, uh, that's wrong. It says the late 80s. It was the early 80s. Uh, the specific time was 1991. Uh, my mom had cancer, and I began thinking about the human body at that point. And so I was taking uh, microbiology photographs that I could find and tried to make them look like uh, large-scale photocopies. I was uh, taking the images, the actual photos, and moving them on copy machines and playing with paint and created uh, a body of work in 1991, and this piece is in the DMA collection, uh, that was emulating the look of cancer cells. Uh, and at the time, I never really told people that. I, at one point, I did at a lecture, and somebody got very upset, and the idea of cancer cells as imagery, and because the paintings also evoked a certain amount of beauty. Uh, so I sort of stayed quiet about it. So, but this was the early work, and I was trying to be an abstract painter that dealt with real subject matter of, that was important. Uh, a few years later, I was invited by the DMA to do a concentrations exhibition in 2001 when Bonnie was there. Uh, I worked with Suzanne Weaver, who was the curator, and produced another body of work. And at this point, I had been going to a urologist at UT Southwestern for some problems, medical problems, which would later lead to cancer. Uh, but it wasn't diagnosed as cancer yet. It was probably way too early. But I was looking around at a lot of the equipment and the printout machines, the electronic machines that they have to look in your body. And I began thinking about those in terms of making my artwork uh, look like that, but yet still blurring the images. In fact, one of the doctors gave me some uh, photos of, of an exploratory uh, biopsy they did of my body. And I told him I was an artist, so he gave me a bunch of copies. And I took them home and pinned them up on my studio wall and began to use them uh, to create this body of work. So it was following that around 2007 or 8 that I did get diagnosed with cancer. And at the time, the doctor reluctantly told me that it was a very aggressive cancer. And so, of course, as an artist, I was very concerned and sort of freaked out for about a week and then came to terms with it. And at the time, I was creating a new body of work that was probably the most beautiful body of work I've ever created, but I never got that far with it uh, because of having to do surgery and I was promised one incision and when I woke up I had six uh, because they thought the cancer had spread already. Uh, and it ended up I was very lucky. The Dr. Warborn told me probably another month and it would have been too late. Uh, so I was very lucky. Uh, so I want to show you this is a body of work that I was commissioned to do uh, working with Courtney Crothers, who's here tonight, uh, which gave me this wonderful opportunity to create this body of work that I had begun in 2007 or 8, but never really pursued it. Uh, it was just sitting around in sketchbooks and on my computer and different files of imagery that I was working with. And so when I was approached uh, through Courtney and Bonnie Pittman, uh, they presented my work to Dr. Podosky, who oversees the UT system, who had been very critical of all of the artwork that they had looked at. And Bonnie suggested, well, why don't you talk to John Pomara? <laughs> He's had cancer. He'll be very sensitive to the clinic and what type of work is there. So here you can sort of see down a hallway, uh, they built this and showed me the plans before the hospital was, was still in the early stages and told me you know, that there would be skylights and everything over each of the paintings. 
Uh, and so I, you know, began working and couldn't quite imagine what this space was going to be at the time, but did my best to, to follow this uh, body of work to a, a completion. And yes, the colors are as intense as what you're seeing on the screen uh, purposely. Uh, and these are 12 feet long, six feet tall. Uh, they were too big for my studio, and so they were in this warehouse, and in fact, they were too large to turn over uh, right way up. You're seeing them sideways here. Uh, in order to see them all together, this is how I had to see them. Uh, the, the warehouse was not even large enough to put them on the floor the right way to see them as a group uh, yet. Uh, that gives you a sense of the scale uh, of what the work was. And what you're looking at in this work uh, the top section are actually parts of human bodies. Because I began to think about what it is for the body to dissolve or to disappear. Uh, because I thought of my own situation and what is it, uh, formlessness was the word that kept coming up into my mind. Uh, how do you paint formlessness. So this was the first time I began to try to actually depict that. And it was the idea, too, of a word choice I give my students every other semester, absence, presence. And I was thinking of that and how do you depict that sort of duality. Uh, and then I placed the colors on the bottom to enhance the beauty of the top half images. So what you're seeing are actually parts of the human body that were severely cropped and magnified six to eight hundred to a thousand percent. Uh, and in order to make it begin to dissolve into this sort of luminous, ephemeral sense of space. I thought of them as being very spiritual as well, not religious, but spiritual. Uh, I tend to be sort of Zen Buddhist in my beliefs, and I wanted the work to sort of reflect the idea of being immersed, not only in beauty, but in this sort of formless ephemeralness that goes with that. Uh, and actually, uh, I altered the colors, so it's not, it's the human body element in the top half, but but I enhanced the color and distort it to make it into something otherworldly. Actually, that's probably a belly button and it's a, a stomach of a, of a human body is what you're looking at. I've never told anybody that except Courtney and, uh, <laughs> and a couple of other people, Bonnie and Courtney, asked me as we walked down that hallway, John, tell us, tell us, what, where is this coming from? When I told them the human body, they go, where? <laughs> and I said, well, it's in the state of formlessness, uh, which brought it into a sense of real beauty. So you're getting to see all seven of them. And to see them, I, and I kept thinking of Mark Rothko the whole time. And it was like I was given my own chapel. And I really seriously thought about that and the idea, because I love Rothko's work. Uh, I, I think, to me, those are profoundly beautiful and they evoke a sort of spiritual quality that I sort of enjoy. Uh, when I was probably 15 in junior high or first year of high school, I had some friends come over to my house and I was looking at art books uh, at a young age and they asked me, well, who are your favorite artists? And at the time, and they still continue to be, uh, I said, well, I like Mark Rothko, but I love Andy Warhol two different spectrums, and my work really embraces both aspects of the idea of reproduction of pop like Warhol, but also the ephemeral beauty of, of a Rothko. Uh, and this is what I wrote that goes with the work at the hospital. If you get a chance, if you're dying of cancer, you get to see them. Uh, how, how are they not outside the X-ray? Uh, they're in the uh, on the new, on oh well, it's a couple of years old oncology clinic uh, for UT Southwestern. They are in front of uh, different nurses stations where people go in for chemo. And so they get to see this work while they're waiting. And I was at a reception at actually Barry Whistler, one of the big openings, hundreds of people there. And I was talking to a group of artists and I had uh, a gentleman walk 
over and he says, I heard somebody say your name is John Pomara. And I said, yes. And he says, I just want to thank you for your work that's in the hospital at the cancer clinic. I, he goes, I think you know that's a place I don't really want to be. But when I go in and I look at that work, he goes, it makes me breathe a little lighter and it just fills me with hope. And I almost began to cry. I, to have my work touch somebody's heart in that way, and I know probably others as well, it just brings me great joy to know that the work is in my own Rothko Chapel. Uh, well, let me go back. Uh, I think this is real important because it was hard to, how do you whittle it down for a common layperson that's coming through the clinic? And so, as I, I want to just read it real quick, real quick. In this group of paintings, I magnified specific parts of the human figure beyond recognition into a blurred state of presence. The colored bottoms were meant to embrace the overall viewer's experience into a metaphysical, almost spiritual vista like a Mark Rothko painting. My desire was to create a state of absence presence where one feels simultaneously a sense of awe and beauty in one's being. To be immersed into a state of awareness, recognizing that beauty is a part of the human experience to be felt as well as viewed. In the art world, I was talking to Courtney right before this, that many artists think beauty is so passe, and it wasn't until the late 90s when Dave Hickey wrote that beauty was okay, and then Peter Sheldahl did a great article about beauty, and so I brought Peter Sheldahl to UT Dallas to talk about beauty, uh, which was a great, great opportunity. Rick Bertel and I took him around to some of the museums, but his talk on beauty, I think, is exceptional. And I do want to close tonight with, because I discovered that I was, I call this my side project, and, and it really began back when I was working on this work. And you can see there were color bars in it as well. And these images are based on cell structures, mostly skin cells, I was looking at. And I'm con I continue this side project, and I've never publicly shown them but once in a gallery, Eugene Bender and Marfa. And was it a mistake? I don't know. A collector bought all 16 of them. Uh, I needed the money and now I regret it because I would still like to have them because I've not really publicly like declared this as an official part of my body of work. Uh, I still work on them, They've, they're getting larger. Uh, Barry Whistler, who's here tonight, who represents my work also in Texas, uh, was in the studio this summer and he said, well, John, when are we ever gonna show these? And I looked at him and I said, in two years. <laughs> I have another show that I'm working on right now, and I said this will be the show after this one, uh, because I do feel like I'm really getting close to the place where I want to show this work. That's it. Thank you. It's great to be here to think about art in a new way. What I want to talk to you about is, and I loved what you said, Jed, about we're compelled to create. And when we think about healing places, I'm going to talk more of the art of where you are. And I think we're in the perfect home, the Nasher, to think about healing when you walk in. And I loved what you were saying about the space, because we go to our place, sick places and they don't always look healthy. And they don't really inspire you to be more of what you have. And most of our healing really comes in the outside world, not in hospitals. So how do we begin to think about our own health? And what I want each of you to do, I think as we were talking tonight about sickness, every single person in this room has had some limitation in their life some hurdle that they've had to redo their life path, take a new, reinvent yourself, like some of the artists that Bonnie shared with us. So it's not just about them, it's about us. 
And I loved what we think about is how do you begin to unlock your own human potential? So we're, we may not be the famous artist, but we all have an immense potential. And that's what we're all about at the Center for Brain Health, is to figure out how individuals, regardless of where they are, can explore the capacity of what's within. And when we think about overcoming physical limitations, it's much about mental. As we work with elite athletes or wounded warriors, it's not so much the physical injuries that they have a hard time overcoming, it's the mental. And we know that when we begin to change their mental ability, it changes their whole body at the molecular level. So we say we go from mind to molecule. As you begin to have someone, and I, I don't know if it was Bonnie, that said post, what we like to think of as post-traumatic growth that people have. Because what I found, the reason I got interested in brain health almost 35 years ago was because I saw so many people given labels your ADHD, your dyslexic, your XYZ, and it never did anything to help them discover their full potential. So exploring the brain and what the potential is very exciting for me. So when, what I wanna share with you today is, I wanted to think about when we designed our space at the Brain Performance Institute, and just the words that we use, because actually every single person in this room has stigma about their brain. If I were to say right now, pull out your pencil, I'm gonna do a brain health physical, you would go, oh. <laughs> I didn't come for that. I came to hear from Jed or Bonnie to do something. Because we have this idea of fixed mindset. We are what we are, we're fixed. We have stigma that nothing can be done and nothing can be further from the truth. So we wanted to create a space and the words I choose, brain health, we don't talk about brain disease, brain injury, we do brain health. The Brain Performance Institute isn't about what's wrong with you, but it's what can you do to optimize your performance. So we worked with our architects for almost a year. We brought in Navy SEALs, wounded warriors, executives, athletes. We wanted them to walk in immediately and not go, <gasps> the white coat's gonna come tell me something's wrong with me. But rather the space would inspire them to be engaged and to really kind of roll up their sleeves and say, I can hardly wait. So when you walk in, there is this big screen that's huge and it shows Louis Schwartzberg's work. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with his work, but he is the number one videographer in the world from National Geographic. And so when you go in, it's living art, it's moving, it's alive. And so you feel like something extraordinary is gonna happen here. We have this big staircase that pulls people up to think I can walk up that way and open spaces to create unexpected places. In our meeting rooms, one of the places we have, this is our big ellipse where we have meetings, like we would have held this meeting in our ellipse room that holds about 120 people, and it's got neurons, this whole chandelier is these neurons to show the activity of the brain that can be inspired, and people come in and they're in awe about what is getting ready to happen, and I loved your word, awe, because we now know from brain science that every time you <coughs> begin to embrace the awe of nature, the awe of the space, like the Nasher, to walk in and go, oh, your brain changes in a very positive way. So we wanted to create <laughs> that space. I, when uh, John was talking about the healing, we also have an imaging suite that we've just opened to look at what are some metrics that we can begin to define for brains getting better? Rather than to detect what's wrong with your brain, can we begin to develop different ways of looking at a brain getting stronger and more resilient and looking at it? But we developed <coughs> what we call the brain reset room. So instead of having people be frightened as to what's getting ready to happen when you go in a scanner, they go into a quiet room 
that's got this very soothing video. They listen to sounds, it's low light, the smell is there. So rather than be sedated or be stressed out as to what's going on, we teach them how to breathe and go in before they go into the scanner. So we use the art and use the space to create this healing in terms of what's happening. And we also have gardens uh, before you go into the imaging suite as well as between the buildings so that people can see the nature of outside. So I want us to realize if you're going to unlock your potential, think about the artists that you've seen tonight and heard about them. How can you use their stories to use the nature around you to visit museums like the nature to become the best you possible? That's what is all about the art in your home, the art that you create to unlock your own potential every single day for the rest of your life. If you were to come in the Center for Brain Health, you would see paintings by a lot of artists who have had different physical disabilities. Uh, Gail Stack, we have a large, gorgeous painting of hers, and she's painting about someone with Alzheimer's disease as they begin to lose their mind but it's so beautiful in terms of the pieces and the fragments that it inspires our groups that we work with with Alzheimer's disease. We have a large number of pieces by Denny Doran, who actually teaches at the Stoop Hot homeless people how to build some of the most beautiful art in the world. So this series, Art and Healing, I think about Bonnie Pittman, and I don't know how many people in this room truly know her, but every single day she lives with dying, and she lives in awe, and she inspires people to do something new. It's that kind of awe and meeting new people and doing new things that makes us reach our fullest potential every single day. It's not every one of us have some disability and the art that we bring to that. And Bonnie blesses my life every single day with that. And I know she blesses yours. And the Nasher, when Kathy said, this is her favorite museum. When you walk in, don't you always get a sense of awe? And you walk in the gardens and the different pathways. Taking advantage of that is the greatest thing we can do. Thank you for organizing the series. Thank you, Sandy. That was great. Okay. Oh, that was. Okay. So um, I'm going to invite the panelists to come up and take their seats on the uh, stage. Um, there are two more lectures if you've enjoyed this one. And I'm just curious because I'm getting ready to prepare my next two talks. How many of you are coming back? Okay. <laughs> I better become innovative. <laughs> All right, no, the next one next week is about um, challenges with mental uh, illnesses. And so uh, it's gonna be a fantastic, of all the lists I had to make of artists suffering different things, that was the longest. And uh, so it's gonna be a very exciting uh, presentation. Mark Goldberg, who is here tonight and um, is uh, gonna be on the panel. And uh, I think it's Catherine who is, with me uh, from the Nasher, and so we're gonna have a, a great evening. And then, um, and then the last one is on eye diseases, I'm sorry. So we hope that you'll come. And there's a new show that's opening over at the DMA that I hope that you'll go to. Um, it, uh, Speechless, it's opening next week, and, uh, or two weeks, and it's about uh, building creative environments by young artists that can be used for people with different uh, physical and, uh, challenges. And, and the Center for Brain Health was uh, on the advisory committee to help um, work with the artists on this on behalf. So um, with that, we're gonna go up and I'm gonna ask one question, and then it's your, your time. Okay, we're gonna get up the steps, yeah. <laughs> There we go, thanks. All right, great, thank you all. So my one question, which I'd invite um, every, everybody, you can, good, I, you, now you can see how far, that's, this is my life. <laughs> so, there we go, there's the, this is what keeps me alive. Um, I'm gonna invite you to, I'm gonna throw it to, um, 
Kathy first, um, so, and then you all pick up after her. My, my question is, and you've worked with um, artists, so you can speak about this as, you, as an artist or a curator, because you've worked with artists in different ways, or Sandy, you've also helped a lot of people. But starting with Kathy, <clears throat> the issue of a person who is, um, when you suddenly, um, your life changes because of a challenge, an illness, a, uh, an accident, um, how, do you see them, how do you, what, are, what are the issues that a person has to go to or ideas they have to go to to come back resilient? Oh, that's an interesting question. <coughs> I, um, you know, one of the things I always like to make a point with is that, you know, it, people getting better from devastating neurological illnesses and things, it's, it's not, it's not that they're motivated or they're unmotivated. I mean, part of it is just what is. And um, so I, I just, I mean, I often have people say, oh, if they were just motivated. And I said, no, you know, sometimes you just can't do things and that's just the way it is. Um, but I think that um, people, almost everyone wants to improve, wants to live life. If people don't not do things because they because they're not motivated. They are, everyone has that desire to be part of the community, to be part of life, to expand, to to improve, to grow. Um, and so it's the thing about the, the thing about art is it it gives people a, an avenue because sometimes it's hard to see what that avenue is when you're paralyzed or or you know you can't see things right, and you'll you'll talk about that more. But I, but I think art gives you an, a a place to experiment, and to to just you can't go wrong. You just can't go wrong. So I think it's uh, you can go wrong with trying to you know hit a ball or things like that. You can't go wrong with art. You just can't because it's who you are. So yeah. I'm curious. One of the things that keeps coming up for me in in all of these situations is, is the notion of perspective. Mm -hmm. And you know, as, as art historians, we're always, you know, looking at looking at something from, you know, the, from the from the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. And so, you know, I can talk about, you know, Matisse going through this um, you know, th this terrible um, surgery and the infection um, to the surgical site and the loss of his mobility. But ultimately, he had, you know, it, it led to, you know, the greatest innovation of his, of his artistic career. That's an awfully sunny way of, <laughs> look, it's a kind of, kind of taking, taking it as the inevitability of it, which is not the case. And it seems that so much of it has to do with one's, one's perspective on what they're looking at, where they are mm -hmm. what? at that moment. And I'm curious about you know, how, how particularly, I mean, how all of you, what, what is your sense of the importance of perspective, either at, you know, as your as a, a clinician helping a patient or as a patient going through what you're going through. Sandy? One, yeah, one of the things I would say, because we've worked with probably uh, really thousands of people now that it's, it is perspective, but it's being able to, when you say compelled to create for me innovative thinking, <coughs> people to think outside the box to see rewire, to get this idea that you're not who you think you are by a label, it just, it keeps people stuck. And I agree with Kathy, they're always motivated, but they say, you don't understand what I could do before. Mm -hmm. So it's the perspective, right. but it's the ability to be <coughs> a very agile, dynamic thinker. And we've been able to show people to change that possibility thinking. And I think artists may naturally be able to see it from different perspectives sometimes, but if we can teach people to be the art of redesigning your life and seeing yourself outside of a diagnosis, 
So we've worked with people with bipolar disease, with very severe depression, and we can say, yes, you are, but how can we help you live mm -hmm. and start doing possibility innovative thinking? Mm -hmm. So it's the creativity that builds to innovation that you start to see different paths of possibilities. But, but Bonnie, I think that maybe answers the questions about resilience too, because I think it's the reset, it's mm -hmm. the ability to reset. Mm -hmm. And and that is, yeah. that is, it's very hard, you know, it's very hard, and you wouldn't know better than anybody, it's very hard to do when you're in pain, you're suffering, mm -hmm. you you have to think about, I mean, every single thing you do in life takes you 10 times longer than it used to take. So, you know, getting dressed, I, I once watched a tetraplegic patient get dressed. So I just sat in his room. I wasn't being a voyeur. This was, this was for me to learn from him. And I sat there and watched him get dressed. And it was an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the best hour and a half I ever spent because I just got to see what his life was. And, and you know, mm -hmm. and it, it, it stopped me from being, mm -hmm. you know, um, so, um, very respectful of of what it means when we're asking people to reset and be resilient mm -hmm. you know and they're so human people spirit. have such courage oh man mm -hmm. the human spirit's a great great thing John uh, I, I think it's a great motivator I found that I just said to myself wow I need to really get busy mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever <laughs> amount of time I have yeah. is yeah that's true. worth so much more than yeah. I realized and I worked like crazy. Uh, a good friend of mine who Bonnie showed earlier tonight, uh, Scott Barber, was one of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. And I watched him in the hospital set up a studio mm -hmm. and he kept painting the mm -hmm. whole time he was going through this uh, process of bone marrow transplant, mm -hmm. which he didn't survive. But he produced an amazing body of work mm -hmm. that Barry Whistler ended up selling almost every one mm. of the pieces. And what was really amazing and touching is he also created a set of small works mm -hmm. which he gave to all of his closest friends. And I own one that he gave me. He handed it to me mm -hmm. uh, himself in a hospital bed. Mm. And, you know, I cried. I mean, it was just such a beautiful piece. So I see it as motivator. And I had a student that came to see me because he had muscular dystrophy. This was when I first started teaching at UT Dallas. And he says, I wanna know, learn how to paint, but nobody will teach me. Could I take your class and could you help me learn how to paint? Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and said, of course I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but I went home and thought a lot about it. He signed up for my course. And, but I told him, you're not going to paint like everybody else in the class. Your work is going to be more unique mm -hmm. and perhaps even more purposeful uh, for yourself. And it was amazing what this young man produced and was admired by all the students in the class uh, because he lacked real control, mm -hmm. just like the Renoir picture. And I told him about Renoir, and I told him about artists like Soutine that were expressionistic, mm -hmm. and he just devoured. Yeah. He went to the library, you know, and looked at all of these artists and their works. Mm -hmm. And to this day, he's still painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're gonna turn it over to you, to all of you, so think of your questions. But the, the one thing I wanted to contribute to this part of the discussion is we, what we haven't talked about is the anger you yeah. feel when you become uh, sick or disabled or any of these challenges. And I'm a prime example of that. In the first two and a half years that I got sick, I absolutely denied it. And so I got sicker and sicker and sicker because I just kept going back to the museum and getting infected again by going to big receptions. I'd sit in my office doing my nebulizer and driving all the curators off the floor because I'd be coughing the whole time. I mean, they even, I mean, it was just, I was in such denial because I was so angry. I was so angry my life was changed so critically by this stupid thing in my body. And so finally, when um, it became clear that I was n not getting better, um, 
And Dr. Rosenblatt said, you know, this was the best decision when I decided to retire from the museum. I called him and he was in, he was in South America. A, and I said, where are you, Randy? This sounds so noisy. And he said, I'm at a waterfall in Colombia. What's going on? I mean, that tells you your connection with your doctor when he picks up your, your phone call in Colombia. And I said, well, I'm going to re resign from the museum because this is really hard. And he said, now you have a chance to save your life. And so sometimes you're so sick you can't hear these things. But it was that summer that I left the museum and, and was very desolate and unhappy. But what happened is that was the time I ended up, of course, in the hospital and then woke up one day and realized I needed to start my practice of doing something new every day. And it changed my life because I realized that being sick was defining me. And I didn't want to be defined that way. I wanted a new life. And so I wrote down this thing after, after I came back from a terrible biopsy. And I said, I'm going to take every day and make it an extraordinary day by intention, by meeting new people, going new places, doing new things. They can be big or little. And so I've done that every day as a way in, in my life to not go to bed at night thinking about being sick or in pain. Mm -hmm. But to go to bed at night thinking about how exciting the day is and this moment is so I can wake up tomorrow and enjoy it. And it's, it's a shift. And that shift is hard fought. And, and now I, and it's 3,036 it's 3, days. So that's almost uh, eight years or nine years. And so I don't recommend that everybody has to do this. But I do it for my own grasp on reality because there is so, so much to celebrate in living. And I think that that's part of what artists and what you do. I think when I've met all these people over these years um, who have been sick in all my infusion clinics and all my hospital visits, there are so many stories to be so told. And the main one is, um, as somebody said up here, is I want to be here and I, I choose to be here. I choose to live my life and I'm not going to give up. And it's the people like you who are lovers and friends and um, caretakers that make the difference and make that happen. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. I hope there's so many hands going up for <laughs> critical questions because we saved time for you. I'm going to try to run the mic. OK. See, I hear a lot of Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. <laughs> I did not plant that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is too simplistic. I've had illnesses that were dangerous, but not eternally life-threatening. And my whole experience of art was complete forgetfulness of my mm -hmm. illness. I was able mm -hmm. to escape. Exactly. And I was able to create a drawing that I could give away as a mm -hmm. gift, as mm -hmm. uh, you've also mentioned. So is that is that too simple to say? No. Oh. It One mm -hmm. simply can retreat into that, and it's a whole other world. It is another world, and, and it's the creative world. I think all of us are so happy that you can do that. And it doesn't have to be a product of, of, uh, that's going to be shown at the Nash or the DMA. It's done because it's part of your, the story of your life. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Sandy can talk about how important those kinds of stories are in the healing process, telling it whether you write it or paint it or whatever. Yeah, I love that you said that you, and when you said you forget, is that, tell me about that. Just, I'm curious, when you said well, you the pain. Not not being whole, or I forgot the whole aspect you, of You redefined being. yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's part of, of what already was mentioned. It was simply allowing myself to go elsewhere. Yeah. And that, that is what I think is the most important thing, is we see people seeing themselves beyond what they thought that what they were before. It's like, this is who I am, and I'm going to embrace how lucky am I to be here despite this past that I had? I carry it with me and I'm more because of it. So as we have people write their narratives, sometimes they embrace that part of it, they don't ignore it, but then they're more because of it and they, they're new, they're better than they were. It, gratefulness. I was right. very grateful. It was grateful. as if somehow some, mm -hmm. someone somehow gave me this healing gift. Yes. But you, you know you deserve 
to be able to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. you deserve to be able to take a vacation. <laughs> you know, I mean, and what Forget. the heck if, if, if painting or doing some sort of creative thing gives you a vacation from what's going on, you uh -huh. deserve it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'd like to ask Bonnie to tell you a oh. story. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the greatest story about doing something like that when you're in the hospital. Oh, the Venice story? Is this that story about when you're in the hospital and you had been there so long? And needed to do something else. You know, and I went to Venice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Cynthia's. They're part of my Baylor pack. And so when I go over to Baylor all the time, I see Cynthia and Susan and, and the whole mm. team. And they keep me occupied. And when I stay longer than just a day, um, then they infuse me with art because they have a great art and medicine program. But this was before the art and medicine program. And it was very early on in my illness. And I was uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rosenblatt. Um, I was in, I had been there for a week and I was really kind of discouraged because every day I asked him, is today the day I can go home? And every day he'd say, mm -hmm. I don't think so. No, maybe not today. Maybe we'll try tomorrow. Let me see you stand up and walk. And then of course I couldn't do that. So we're into week two and I was really, really, really mad. And uh, that's not a good place to go. And I got up early one morning and put my hand on the window uh, as the sun was rising and at Baylor and said, I am leaving Baylor. That's it. I'm just going to go. And so I, what I did is I wrote to all my friends that day and said, I'm leaving Baylor and I'm going to Venice. And so um, out went this email to my art history friends, to my colleagues, to my family, who wrote back very quickly and hysterically, what do you mean you're leaving? <laughs> Randy got a lot of phone calls and uh, <clears throat> saying, you can't leave Baylor. And the truth was I couldn't. But what I did do was I created Venice in my room. And so it was very similar to some of the other, uh, it was my own kind of creative response that time, is the pictures that my friends sent in, the art historians sent all these views of Venice. Photographers sent me their favorite pictures. I had been to the Venice Biennale many times, and so were the lots of pictures of us on the Vaporettos and exhausted walking in the, in the uh, Biennale. And so all of this came together along with music and poetry. And so suddenly my stuffy old green room at Baylor became Venice. And so Dr. Rosenblatt always said he knew I was getting better when I went up and down the door into the doors of anybody who was open and I would start talking to them about Venice. And so every, all the nurses and technicians knew about Venice. And as I got further and further down my row, he said, maybe in a few days you can go home. <laughs> so Venice was my, and that's when I realized how important art was in my healing. And that's why I use so specifically the museum and the, na the two museums, all the museums around here, but the Nasher and the DMA all the time to, to come because it's my place where I, I can heal and nobody else is around. Mm -hmm. Others? Hi, so I'm a studio art major at SMU and I've been doing like a medical illustration internship at UT Southwestern and I can't think of a better panel to ask like, <laughs> <laughs> like what do you think the role and importance of medical illustrations are? We'll start with Dr. Bell. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Oh. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the work of a medical illustrator is to really be able to take the learner, and we all learn constantly, into the actual realm of the body. We can't go in there, and I mean, I know there's all these digital things and whatnot, you know, but, but it's to really be able to kind of open up those private places and let us really be able to see what's going on and to understand the relationships and the perspective and whatnot. And so, you know, every time, um, and, and this is because I, you know, grew up with what um, Netter and, and all those <laughs> folks, right? Mm -hmm. That, um, you know, whenever I start an, I, an IV or I'm doing something, I am visualizing that arm. It's right, it's here. So that artwork is here. And that's how I do things. I mean, because I have to have that in my head. And, I, and, and um, 
you know, it, it's, it's so, I mean, you just don't realize, I think, how it affects care mm -hmm. as people go along. It's really interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. It, yeah, and I would add just uh, the medical illustrations, I think if it's added with the new technology mm -hmm. of virtual mm -hmm. reality, people, one of the things that we're interested in is brain imaging and taking yeah. mm -hmm. the medical illustrations so that people can almost quit being afraid of it and get this idea of how dynamic it is. It, it can change your perspective. And so that's one of the areas that we want to really specialize in is visualization of medical to get people out of this fear mode too. So I think medical illustrations with all the new technology is going to be transformed yeah. in a very important way for us to get rid of the fear of what, what it is all about to kind of embrace the amazing part of this human body and especially the brain. It's just truly exciting. To it makes it touchable. Mm -hmm. I mean, by, by other humans, mm -hmm. so it's really important. And, yeah, um, kudos yeah. to you. We all need good medical illustrations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we used, uh, yeah. we had done a lot of, a series of, of fact sheets, fact sheets for consumers, right, about brain injury. Fact sheets for consumers, doesn't that sound inviting? <laughs> and and, one image, yeah. and we were ha I was hanging out with, with one of my, uh, actually with a patient, but also worked on one of my research projects. And, and he said, you know, I really hate these things. And I said, yeah. I said, I get it. So he said, how about, how about we do comic books? So we actually ended up getting, hiring graph, different graphic artists. And that was so much fun, too. because And, and to get, we turned all of these fact sheets into mm. comics, into graphic, <laughs> graphic medical products mm -hmm. with just great art, mm -hmm. just fun, brings you into it. It just... Mm -hmm. And they just, people love them. They go like wildfire. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the printed fact sheets sit there and the, the graphic art goes, wow. Yeah. You know? That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's, maybe this is our last. Yeah, our last. Thank you, Anna. Well, I just wanted to say something. As I was listening, I was taking some notes in my phone. So I'm going to open it. So. <laughs> okay, so as, uh, again, as I was listening, so all these artists that you guys were mentioning, Matisse, Henri Matisse, Renoir, and even yourselves, right? They all practiced perseverance, resilience, creativity, right? And they all took action mm -hmm. relentlessly. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. they celebrated small victories, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they embraced reality. And by doing so, that's how they actually unlocked their potential, their brain potential. Mm -hmm. That's what I can see. And by doing so, they actually became the best versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's just wonderful to just see that this is a process since back in the 1900s to today, right? And hello, Dr. Bale. I work Hello, Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I just wanted to say thank you all for uh, putting this together. I feel very lucky to be here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That was a wonderful way to end tonight's yeah. program yeah. Um, with the inspiration. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. We hope you'll come to Lisa another one of these. There are two more. And I especially want to thank my friends on the panel for tonight. Um, it was a special evening for all.